We love you, Kevin. You're letting me be on film. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're not in the movie. <laughs> The first Predator film was a success, but since sequels were not the guiding force of entertainment back in the 1980s, Fox didn't jump at the idea to start a new one. Jim and John Thomas, the original writers of the first film, did try to approach the idea of a sequel, but Fox was silent on the issue. Then, the writer's strike struck Hollywood during March 7th, to August 7th in 1988, and it was the longest WGA strike in history, lasting 153 days. Almost half a year of production was lost to all studios, and Fox needed to release some money-making films to recoup lost profits. Although Fox wasn't thinking that Predator would be one of those, they started warming up to the idea, because betting on sequels for immediate brand recognition seemed the way to get fast profits. And that's one of the main reasons why many sequels were fast-tracked just after the strike in order to get them to theaters quickly by 1989 and 1990. The writing brothers contacted Fox again, and the studio wanted to be sure there was brand recognition for Predator. And they told the brothers that there was a license pending for a new comic book series which would follow the first Predator film. If sci-fi fans gobbled up the material, Fox would be better positioned to move on a sequel. So, more waiting followed. When the comic was released in June 1989, it was received well, and it followed the story of Dutch's brother who was a homicide detective during a heat wave in New York, plagued with gang violence. While he looked for details on his lost brother, Major Alan Dutch Schaefer, from the first film. Now, there are a lot of similarities from this comic that did actually end up in the film, as you can see from the pictures. After the comic came out during the summer of 1989, power producer Joel Silver, responsible for the first Predator film, read the comic and personally called author Mark Verhaden and told him he really admired it. One day, out of the blue, I got a call from Joel Silver, who produced Predator, and to me it was like getting a call from... It was incredible. Getting a call just out of the blue from this guy. Silver told Verhaden that he would like to use his comic as a template for a possible Predator sequel. Then Silver contacted Fox and expressed that he wanted to pursue a sequel and immediately the idea was greenlit due to Silver's power in Hollywood at the time. A meeting was scheduled with Verhaden and Jim and John Thomas I was asked to talk through where my comic series was going, and I did. Jim and John liked a lot of Verhaden's story elements, but they felt strongly about making the movie about Arnold's character Dutch rather than his brother. The Gary Busey character was always somebody that we envisioned as being that part of the government that knows something that no one else knows about. Uh, Danny's character was always uh, the part that we envision for Arnold. When it was all said and done, Ver Hayden was thanked and returned to his comic, which would last three more issues. Soon after the meeting, Fox showed up and asked the brothers what they had in mind. They had many ideas to offer the studio. One took place in the Old West, and another was having the film take place on another world. We had five or six sequel approaches all ready for them. One was a fantasy I always had about putting the creature in an urban jungle, and as it turned out, that was the idea that Fox liked. Now you may be thinking this comment is very self-serving, while a lot of the elements from the urban idea was from the comic maker, but their earlier ideas were a bit different from Verhaden's main storyline, and on top of that, it should be mentioned that Ver Hayden himself said, I didn't create Predator, and I didn't work on the script for part two, even if some ideas from my comic were used. And on my way out, the Silver folks asked if I had any properties, and long story short, I wound up writing my first studio screenplay, adapting my comic book The American, for Silver and Warner Brothers, so the story had a happy ending. Verhaden would later contribute to screenplays for The Mask and Time Cop, and would be an executive producer on TV shows like Smallville, 
and several episodes of the Battlestar Galactica remake. Later, the character of Mark Verhaden in Aliens vs. Predator would be named after him. To show you how different the writer's ideas were originally from the comic, we have to investigate their very elusive 60-page treatment that has yet to be leaked, but after several interviews, we can piece together many of the nuts and bolts of their initial ideas that they wrote down in July and August before a director was on the project. The title of this treatment was called Predator 2 Body Count and it would start with a predator landing in the ruins where the predator from the first film died. It would find the predator's arm and replay the footage of Dutch's fight with a dead creature from its arm computer, which is somehow partially intact. With this information, the new predator would fly off in search of Dutch. We would then cut to a helicopter that lands on a golf course. And there's a guy with white hair playing golf and they come and say, you know, he's back. And then Arnold turn around, he's got white hair with a scar across his face. Then we would meet Harrigan, who is fighting crime and is investigating a new killer who is hanging folks upside down. Dutch would then get close to Harrigan, working with him like a buddy cop movie. Meanwhile, a government agent named Keyes is in the background, trying to capture the Predator and learn from it. By the end of the film, Dutch and Harrigan would form into a strong team to kill the Predator. Now, it is abundantly clear that the movie was going to be about Harrigan and Dutch working together to take down the Predator. It was never intended for Arnold to play the character of of keys ever even though the rumor has been around for years this was debunked by director Stephen Hopkins himself he was gonna play the guy who'd been through that madness had left like the gunslinger and I think keys pulled it back in but the keys wasn't such a big character in the original script and because Arnold didn't do it he became a much bigger character uh, as opposed to, and he was going to use the government and eventually ally himself with Harrigan and go head to head with the creature. While the two brothers worked on their script, things were moving fast because the studio had already put a date for filming and everything was fast-tracked thanks to Joel Silver's interest in the sequel. Silver quickly rehired Stan Winston and his team to continue working on the Predator series and then he looked for a director. At first, he asked John McTiernan as it made sense to have him return to the franchise, but McTiernan wanted to work on Hunt for Red October instead. So... Joel offered it to Stephen Hopkins, who was just finishing post-production on A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. Hopkins had never seen Predator when he took the directing gig, so he steeped himself into the Predator franchise and even asked John McTiernan for advice when he took the job. Hopkins was also given the 60-page draft that featured both Dutch and Harrigan as he took a quick break to visit his daughter in London before starting the project. Fox, not wanting to waste time, sent Jim and John to London as well so they could meet with the director during his off time. That was great because I was able to get in there from the ground up and add my own ideas from the start. I added the opening street shootout and the subway train scene. These were more ideas for sequences as opposed to narrative ones. While working with the writers in August 1989, Hopkins drew hundreds of storyboards for Predator 2. Stan Winston got to work right away, and with free time on his hands, he began making different costumes that were decorated with markings to differentiate Predators. Robotic work began moving forward, and the concepts were flying, including some weapons like the net and spear that Jim and John had put in their early concepts. When Stephen Hopkins visited Stan and his team, he expressed a desire for many new trinkets and weapons for the Predator beyond what was just in the script. The next step was to see if Arnold was available for the project, and that would be another hurdle since the writers envisioned Arnold as one of the main characters. Arnold was super busy, and although he was interested in returning to Predator, it was a delicate negotiation with him because of money and time. He was currently working on Total Recall and the filming for that movie would not end till August. He was also scheduled to star in Kindergarten Cop which started filming during late spring 1990 and early summer 1990. So the window was very short for them to utilize Arnold if he was to be a main 
character and filming would have to start very quickly after Total Recall ended. This concreted the idea that Dutch needed to share the spotlight in the film with another and it was evident he needed to have a smaller part unless the studio was willing to wait to make the film. But if you know anything about Fox's style, they waited for nothing. Steven did state he had a meeting with Arnold Schwarzenegger and attested his involvement was possible. But then things drastically changed with Arnold suddenly. James Cameron asked Arnold to return to Terminator 2, and that was said to be a big factor in his involvement with Predator 2. Director Stephen Hopkins stated that Arnold was told by Cameron that if he did Predator 2, he couldn't do Terminator 2 due to time constraints. So Schwarzenegger picked Terminator. Arnold stated his re reasons for not returning was more artistic than financial, suggesting he didn't like the script or the direction the sequel was taking. Producer John Davies would later attest, Arnold asked for $250,000 more than Fox was willing to offer, and that broke the deal. As always, we're not going to pass judgment on conflicting views unless we have lots of receipts to support such a decision. So, it's up to you to sift out what you think the truth is and draw your own conclusions. Now that Arnold was out, the entire project needed to be redefined, and the writers would have to rewrite all their work accordingly. Without Arnold, the idea went back to a lone cop like the comic who was hunting the Predator. It was stated that the two writers coalesced their ideas during the late summer of 89, and then committed to writing their first version of the script. It is attested that they wrote it within three weeks, and if that's the case, they would have written this screenplay sometime in September. The first completed script was finished on October 6th, 1989, and was titled Predator 2, The Hunt Continues. The start of the film would begin with the exact same crane shot and Predator 2 title, except it would be in New York and the Predator is observing a black market gun sale during a sweltering heat wave. At this gun sale is Scorpio. Come and get it. The Scorpio is ready. Who would betray the sellers and guns blare, language spews, and death follows after showing that their briefcase of money is fake near the bottom. We then cut to the police cordoning off the area, and Detective Mike Harrigan emerges. He is described as German-Irish and in his 30s. He is followed by Leona Williams, who was originally black, and Daniel Cutter, better known as Danny. Like the movie, Harrigan takes charge, and the warehouse is much the same with Harrigan ending up on the roof and taking out a crazed gunman. After taking out the man, Harrigan sees the predator, but is not sure what he saw. Like the movie, they find the bodies before Chief Heineman would appear and dress down Harrigan for his brash actions. Meanwhile, agents would land in a helicopter near the site. We then cut to the precinct where Harrigan passes a lawyer named Pettibone and asks him, Excuse me, counselor, I've been meaning to ask you. Does my ex-wife still like to do it on the kitchen floor? Leona would then follow and chide Pettibone as well. Harrigan would sit with Captain Pilgrim, who informs him that the feds are taking over, but the scene would go on to show a softer side. Harrigan would ask the captain to join his team at a local establishment to celebrate Leona's birthday. Then the captain would ask if Harrigan is bringing someone, and Harrigan would say no. Then the captain would encourage him to let go of his last relationship and to find someone else. Jerry Lambert would then be introduced. But in this script, he was called Tony D'Angelo. But for simplicity's sake, I will refer to this character as Lambert, as he is in the final film. I will also create my own word by saying this character is not Paxtonized. He is a bit low-key in this script and lacks the charisma of Bill Paxton, so he is a more bland character. Anyways, it is revealed that Harrigan was a boxer before he was a cop, and he was a good one. We then cut to a kid scene, but he offers no candy to the Predator and runs away. In this script, instead of a screaming sex scene that's interrupted, a Colombian is pleading for his life in an alcove at night while Gold Tooth states, Shit, 
Abens. <laughs> As he begins the ritual to take his soul, the predator then kills them all. The scene would then fade as Goldtooth screams and it transitions into a siren where Harrigan and his team speed towards the crime scene. Over the radio, responders are told not to enter, but Harrigan ignores it. Harrigan and Keyes meet, just like the film, and the parasite journalist, Pope, is forced away from the scene. Harrigan then takes Leona to her party at Ray's Tavern. At the party, we meet Leona's husband, and she can't drink because she is pregnant. Back at the crime scene, Danny is killed, much like the movie. We then go to Heinemann's office, where Harrigan is dressed down and suspended by the chief, while Captain Pilgrim tries to protect the detective. Harrigan turns in his badge and gun. The captain Captain swears to help Harrigan, but the detective states he's going to avenge Danny's death. Though the captain states it's a police matter, he does encourage Harrigan that if he finds the person responsible, make sure he kills him. In other words, he will turn a blind eye if Harrigan looks into the matter. Then Harrigan confronts Keyes, like the film, and leaves. With Harrigan out, Leona and Lambert are given the case to investigate in cooperation with the feds, so they tell Harrigan he's still in and they ask him what to do. When Harrigan meets the forensics lab doctor, Arno, she inspects the blade and it is discovered the blade is like liquid metal. Remember, this was a year before Terminator 2. When piercing something, the blade actually lubricates itself to better puncture objects, which I think should have remained in the film as it's a really cool concept. In this version, it was intended for Lambert to cover Harrigan during his meeting with King Willie, but the Jamaicans would pick him up, ruining the meeting plans. The meeting with King Willie happens just like the film, and then we would cut back to Ray's tavern, where Harrigan is told about King Willie's death. Then there would be scenes of the Predator following Harrigan through the city. During this, Harrigan would pass a taxidermy shop. The Predator would then follow Harrigan, and it too would look at the taxidermy shop in fascination. The Predator would enter, looking at stuffed bears and lions, and it would pet one while becoming visible. A taxidermist, seeing a form, would ask if he can help him, but then he sees nothing. Finally, they close in on the slaughterhouse. While driving there, there is a soft moment where Lambert and Leona have a discussion about the community they serve. When they arrive to the slaughterhouse, it is quarantined for some reason. Harrigan orders them to check out the paperwork on it, and they drive him home. We then get to view Harrigan's apartment, and there is a moment where he thinks someone is watching him inside, but it turns out to be a cat in the room by an open window. Later that night, the subway scene occurs, identical to the film, and then Harrigan is woken up by a phone call. It is Captain Pilgrim telling him to come to the subway crime scene immediately. When Harrigan arrives, they find two bodies, suggesting that both Lambert and Leona did not survive. By their bodies are some of King Willie's dreadlocks and a memento reminding Harrigan of Lambert. Then a really silly scene occurs where some rednecks are annoyed by Harrigan's fast driving towards the slaughterhouse. The rednecks chase after him yelling citizens arrest. Harrigan shoots out their truck tires and the truck conveniently slides into a police station where the cops turn leveling their guns at the stunned rednecks. Harrigan arrives at the meat plant and is captured by Keys. While their Keys fills him in just like the film, but he adds a lot of tidbits. This script revealed footage of Dutch and Anna being debriefed in interrogation rooms, and there was a fair amount of dialogue for each character. So at least a cameo of Dutch and Anna was expected for this script. The team sent into the slaughterhouse is ambushed by the creature, and unlike the film, Keyes does not go in with his team. Then Harrigan leaves to help the dying men, and everyone is dead when he gets there. The Predator plays games with Harrigan by mimicking Leona's and King Willie's voice. Then the Predator laughs after firing on Harrigan, who avoids it and fires back. When Harrigan finally downs the Predator, he removes its mask like the film, and the Predator 
predator escapes the packing plant. The chase then ensues with the rooftop, cutting the predator's arm off and applying its first aid. The old lady brings some comic relief, and then we continue the chase under the elevator to a boiler room, where Harrigan and the predator fight some more until the predator literally disappears. Harrigan follows the blood trail to a wall and discovers that it's a hologram. Harrigan passes through the fake wall to find himself in an abandoned subway with an alien ship in front of him. Harrigan walks by the ship and tries to touch the hull, and when he does, the ship's skin opens where he contacts it, and through the opening, Harrigan can see trophies amassed by the Predator. He then hears a noise and finds the dying Predator just outside its ship, with no strength to make it back inside. Harrigan is about to do a mercy kill for the Predator, when a bunch of laser lights focus on him and he can hear predators around him. Ten predators appear and he drops his axe. The predators then take the dying hunter away while Greyback throws Harrigan a pistol dated 1640. At the end of the film, the ship flies away and Harrigan makes it outside as he passes Keys, who is frustrated that they were so close. Harrigan states he will get another chance and the film ends. The description of early Harrigan was German-Irish and it is purported that Patrick Swayze was approached to play Harrigan opposite Arnold. Swayze was very popular at the time, especially thanks to Roadhouse. However, Swayze couldn't do the part because he was recovering from an injury that he got while filming that movie. When Swayze was not possible, Hopkins was told to talk to Steven Seagal for the role who was currently getting a name for himself thanks to the movie Above the Law. Seagal was interested, but the actor thought thought he was a power player and was in a negotiating position. So, he suggested changing fundamental aspects of the character Harrigan by turning him into a CIA psychiatrist who was a martial arts expert. Clearly, Seagal was turning Predator into a Steven Seagal vehicle instead. Hopkins smartly passed on this one-note actor and his demands. Soon after, Hopkins would find someone to champion for a better lead in the form of Danny Glover. But we will have to get into that in our next video. For now, that's the end of this one, and we will see you in the next one. And just be thankful Steven Seagal was not the choice for the lead in Predator 2. What? <laughs> Does that bother you? Why are you the way that you are? I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. If you like what you see here, click like and subscribe. Use super thanks. It helps.